focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our usual Wednesday reporters in Handan and Yoon hae -jung. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening to you guys. We are going to start things off with some economy-related news for a change year as South Korea's industrial output posted the biggest gain in nearly three years in the month of August. Uh, and this is uh, due to it boosted by uh, boosted by chip production recovery. Uh, Don, you're going to start us off here. Let's get the latest figures. South Korea's factory output unexpectedly jumped in August by the fastest rate since February 2021. The industrial output rose 2.2 percent from the previous month, backed by a strong uh, semiconductor sector, according to Statistics Korea. Production of semiconductors rose 13.4 percent on month, posting the largest increase since March. It's an 8 percent jump from last year. The figure marked marks the first rebound in 13 months as well. The trade ministry analyzed that although Korea's chip exports in September fell for the 14th straight month to around $10 billion, the month logged the highest monthly export value this year amid signs of recovery in global chip demand. And on the back of a strong performance of the chip sector, all Four major sectors that constitute all industry production increased. Mining climbed 5.5 percent, rising by the biggest margin in over three years, while the construction sector and public administration rose 4.4 percent and 2.5 percent, respectively. Service sector edged up 0.3 percent on the back of strong performances in the arts, sports and leisure industries, which advanced over 6 percent. It's the first time that all of the four major sectors posted a gain since March last year. The output from electric, uh, electric components, on the other hand, moved down 3.8 percent on month. Retail sales, a gauge of private spending, fell 0.3 percent over the period due to weak demand for durable goods such as automobiles, which slipped 1.1 percent. The demand for semi-durable goods, including clothes, also fell 0.6 percent on month in August. Facility investment, on the other hand, jumped 3.6 percent. The rise was driven by the shipbuilding industry, which rose over 13 percent, with the machine sector also posting a 0.6 percent increase. The finance ministry assessed that robust job market, accumulated household savings, and the persistent demand for investment in cutting-edge sectors are some of the positive factors driving up consumption and investment, but said it will remain vigilant over persistent global uncertainties, including the rise in oil prices and the prolonged monetary tightening. Yeah, definitely good news to see that uh, we are seeing the semiconductor uh, sector rebounding. And uh, one of the things that uh, the South Korean government did mention that uh, moving towards uh, the latter half of the year that there's going to be a rebound in the demand for semiconductors and we're seeing that uh, just about now and uh, as semiconductors of course uh, make up a large chunk of South Korea's export uh, certainly would love to see a rebound in that uh, in the meantime the US Treasury yields rose to a 16 year high uh, this on Tuesday local time as investors weighed in on the prospect that the Federal Reserve's high interest rate policy will last longer than previously expected we had even Fed Chairman Jerome Powell uh, hinting at yet another hike before the end of this year, which ultimately impacted the stock markets, uh, including us here in, in the country. Uh, Hejung, let's get the latest figures on that. Right. The 10-year Treasury yield, which serves as a benchmark for global bond rates, shot up to above 4.8 percent on the third. According to TradeWeb, a U.S. electronic trading platform, the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury note was 4.81 percent, around 3.30 p.m. PM Eastern Time, the highest level in 16 years since August 2007, before the global financial crisis. Now, this is a spike of 13 basis points compared to the same time the previous day. And the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury note has continued its upward trend after breaking the 4.5 percent threshold on September 27th. Meanwhile, the yield on the 30-year U.S. Treasury note was at 4.95 percent, the highest 
since October 2007. It seems that the growing realization that high interest rates may persist longer than expected is pushing bond yields higher. Also at last month's FOMC meeting was a little more hawkish than expected. Uh, This also helped push rates higher. And a couple of Fed officials have also supported tighter monetary policy, reinforcing the Fed's hawkish stance. Now, meanwhile, leading Wall Street figures have also also spoken out for the need to prepare for higher interest rates. J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon said we should be prepared for 7% interest rates in a TV interview. The labor market data also increased expectations of a prolonged Fed tightening as there was a rebound in job openings. According to the numbers released by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, private sector job openings rose to 9.61 million in August, up 690,000 or 7.7 percent from the previous month, and well above market expectations of 8.8 million. And as bond price and yield are inversely related. As bond yields spiked, the plunge in bond prices has renewed concerns about bank liquidity risk. The dollar has also been breaking its yearly highs in line with rising bond yields. The U.S. dollar index, which tracks the greenback against six other important currencies, rose to 107.35 on the morning of October 3rd, the highest level since November last year. We are, of course, going to also talk about the impacts it's had on the stocks. Again, we talked about that despite the fact uh, that the U.S. Fed has been very aggressive for uh, more than a year now, uh, since I believe was it uh, March of last year is when they started really getting aggressive with the rate hikes. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon. We have the Korean stocks plummeting amid slump in tech shares and, of course, the concerns over the U.S. Fed's uh, longer than expected period of hawkish tightening. Uh, Tan, break down the numbers for us. Sure. Korea's benchmark cost be traded more than 2% lower this morning and ended at 24.05, down 59 points or 2.4% from the previous session's close. This marked the largest drop in seven months since a decrease of 2.5% in March. Foreigners and institutions sold a net 404 billion one and 469 billion one, respectively, dragging down the index. Individuals made purchases worth a net 835 billion one. Tech heavy Kazdaq plunged by 4%. Stocks were swayed by a sharp rise in the 10-year U.S. Treasury yields that rose to another 16-year high, as Hejong reported, amid inflation fears and the U.S. Fed's prolonged monetary tightening. The $1 exchange rate rose by more than 14.1 in the wake of the surge in U.S. Treasury yields, hitting the highest level in 11 months. Exchange market closed at 1363.51, up 14.1 from the previous trading. Analysts said that stronger than expected U.S. jobs data, U.S. Fed's additional rate hike and the surge in Treasury yields are uh, have led to continued dollar strength. I just uh, had a chance to look at the, the gold uh, prices that are coming out. We're mentioning the strengthening U.S. bond uh, rates and uh, the gold has plummeted. Uh, the past 24 hours here, looking at uh, 3.4%, uh, it dropped. Uh, this is, of course, uh, this is just for uh, Korea right now. Usually when the, the bond numbers do go up, uh, you have uh, the, the gold prices that uh, tank quite a bit as well. But again, the bigger concern is not really the gold, uh, but the bigger currencies, uh, the bigger concern is the currency right now. It is kind of on a, uh, it's slightly going down compared to last week uh, when it peaked at uh, 1,361 uh, to the U.S. dollar, but still, as the U.S. Fed is going to continue with their aggressive rate hike. And it doesn't seem the Bank of Korea is going to respond with the rate hike themselves. Uh, The only thing that we're getting is that there's not going to be any rate cuts uh, until maybe next year, which means that, of course, the the interest gap uh, gap between uh, the U.S. Fed and the the Bank of Korea is going to increase further, which then, of course, is going to increase, uh, lead to a weakening Korean one against the greenback. And... We'll have a whole bunch of other repercussions before that. Uh, We'll leave it at that for the economy side of things here and talk about Japan and their plan to begin the second release of wastewater from their crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. This is going to begin on Thursday, according to local reports. And uh, they're saying that they're going to be releasing a similar amount as the first discharge. Uh, Hejong, let's get the latest updates on that. 
Right. Japan is reportedly getting ready to release a second batch of wastewater from the Fukushima nuclear power plant starting tomorrow. Tokyo Electric Power Company, the organization in charge, will take a small amount of contaminated water, which has been diluted with seawater, and test the level of the radioactive substance called tritium. Then, if the level meets the safety limit, the release will begin as planned. The first release, which began on August 20th, 24th until September 11th saw 7,788 tons of contaminated water released into the sea, and TEPCO plans to release a similar amount this time as well. Now, earlier, TEPCO said that traces of four types of radionuclides, including carbon-14 and cesium-137, were detected in samples of the contaminated water to be discharged in the second round, but it was confirmed that it met the discharge standards. Now, TEPCO and the Japanese government have emphasized that there were no problems with the water release equipment during the first discharge and that there were no abnormalities in the seawater or fish collected from the surrounding area. The second release will take around 17 days. Uh, After mixing the contaminated water with large amounts of seawater, 460 tons of water will be released each day. Meanwhile, China banned all Japanese seafood imports after the first release, and Russia is also considering following suit. Now, TEPCO on Monday started receiving reports of reputational damage from the Japanese fishing industry related to compensation for foreign import bans. Now, Tokyo's Nikkei Shimbun estimates the economic losses to be around 66 million U.S. dollars. And regarding the second discharge, the Korean government's stance is to dispatch experts to the Fukushima site again and thoroughly check the situation and information related to the water release. Again, uh, I had a chance to look at the IAEA's uh, live, uh, I guess, uh, in, what is it, uh, up-to-date uh, information on the discharge. And uh, it's not updated because they've cut down, uh, they've stopped after the first one. Once, of course, it activates the release tomorrow. Uh, we'll get more of the tritium uh, concentration after dilution and so forth. And so that's the big thing that we have to look at is the, the tritium uh, concentration after dilution. And I believe uh, the level is, it has to be less than 1,500 becquerels per liter. And I believe on the all the days that I've seen it, it's gone way below, something like a 140th of the allowed uh, standards. And so, so far, it seems like at least according to what the IAEA standards are said, it's been safe so far. But... We have still seen public sentiment on Japan's water discharge still very much hostile uh, here in Korea. But uh, we had top diplomats of both South Korea and Japan getting together, uh, highlighting the strategic importance of the two countries' cooperation. Uh, Tom, let's get more on that. Sure. Japanese Foreign Minister Yoko Kamikawa attended a ceremony held in Tokyo marking Korea's National Foundation Day on Tuesday. This marked the first time a Japanese leader attended a ceremony commemorating Korea's national holiday in five years uh, since former Foreign Minister Taro Kono took part in a commemorative event in 2018. Kamikawa stressed that Korea-Japan as well as Korea-Japan-U.S. cooperation is more important than ever in tackling various global challenges, calling South Korea an important neighbor. She also expressed hopes to visit Seoul soon. Kamikawa, who was appointed as Japan's new foreign minister last month, vowed to work together with Korea to further develop Seoul-Tokyo relations, cherishing her long-lasting friendship with Korean lawmakers. She also mentioned that she held close talks with uh, Foreign Minister Park Jin last month on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. Korean ambassador to Japan, Yoon Dong-min, during a keynote speech, assessed that Seoul-Tokyo ties have improved dramatically thanks to President Yoon's leadership and strong determination. Mentioning that uh, Yoon and Kishida held six rounds of summits in the past six months, he said economic and uh, people-to-people exchanges between the two countries are recovering at a rapid pace. Ambassador Yoon pointing out that October 
28th marks the 25th anniversary since the Kim Dae-jung Obuchi Declaration, joint declaration, he urged the need to elevate Seoul-Tokyo relations to the next level, with an aim to contribute to resolving regional and global crises. The declaration centered on uh, then-leaders of South Korea and Japan, President Kim Dae-jung and uh, Prime Minister Obuchi's agreement to build a new partnership and work towards future-oriented relationship. And uh, the essence of the declaration lied in Japan's apology and the recognition of the suffering caused to the Korean people uh, during Japan's imperialistic past. Some 1,200 participants attended the ceremony, including Korean residents in Japan, business leaders, as well as uh, former Japanese prime ministers and foreign ministers uh, and top Japanese politicians. The two countries uh, cemented their ties by showing support for Busan's bid to host the 2030 World Expo and also zooming in on popular K-dramas and cultural exchanges as well. Let's uh, talk domestic politics, and uh, we're going to talk more about this in the second hour of the program with Professor Choi Gyeong, but that certainly has been a very uh, turbulent time uh, for the uh, the the party the main parties out there both the ruling and the opposition parties uh, not just the uh, issue over Lee Jae Myung but uh, we have the ruling and opposition parties failing to now narrow their differences over whether Shin Won Sik uh, he is of course the nominee for South Korea's defense ministerial position uh, whether or not he is qualified for the position the progress report on the National Assembly's confirmation hearing on Shin is unlikely to be adopted Hae Jung let's get the latest on this. Right. First, for some background, under the Confirmation Hearing Act, the National Assembly is required to hold a hearing and send a progress report to the government within 20 days of the date the hearing request is sent. For a new nominee whose request for a personnel hearing was sent to the National Assembly on September 15th, the deadline for the progress report is today. And according to the Confirmation Hearing Act, if the report is not adopted by the deadline, Line, the president can request the report to be resent within 10 days. But the president can also force the appointment if the National Assembly does not issue a hearing report by the last deadline. And while the People Power Party argues that Shin is a qualified candidate because he is a defense expert and a former general with strategic command, the Democratic Party argues that he is unqualified because of his past controversies over foul language and his biased view of history. The PPP has proposed to arm the report with details on both sides that make Shin a qualified and unqualified candidate. But the DP reportedly stuck to its opinion that Shin is unqualified and they failed to find a common ground. Now, political observers believe that President Yoon will ask the National Assembly to send the report on the new nominee and proceed with the appointment process. Now, in this case, the new nominee will become the 18th ministerial appointee in the current administration to be appointed without a personnel hearing report. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the consensus is, despite the fact that you're going to get this continuous uh, opposition from the main opposition party and Democratic Party of Korea, that, uh, you know, President Yoon is still going to push forth uh, for this ministerial position. But the reason why it could also uh, be a problem or a liability for the People Power Party is that there might be a reporter, uh, uh, voters who are basically saying, well, I mean, there's obviously reasons why uh, they're going against this and they're still pushing forward to this uh, and it might impact them and the, the support rate uh, uh, moving forward here. But on the flip side, I think the other argument is that the DP has been basically going against everything that the the UN administration has been going from uh, for the, from the very uh, get-go. So they're going to take this as another example of uh, a huge, I guess, uh, opposition from the uh, the Democratic Party of Korea. Uh, while we're covering defense-related issues, let's talk about this. Uh, North Korea recently amended its constitution to enshrine its nuclear policy, and it seems that the defense ministry has given out a quite a stern warning to Pyongyang today. Uh, tell us more about this. 
Right. The defense ministry warned that North Korea will face the end of its regime if it attempts to use nuclear weapons. And as you've mentioned, this warning comes after North uh, convened a key parliamentary meeting last week with its leader Kim Jong-un in attendance to stipulate the policy of strengthening its nuclear force in the constitution. Now, Pyongyang's constitutional amendment stated its ambition to advance its nuclear capabilities, reinforcing the idea that denuclearization Nuclearization is not up for discussion. So in response, Korea's defense ministry said South Korea's military possesses a joint Seoul-Washington readiness posture that can overwhelmingly respond to any attack from North Korea. It added that such threats to peace and stability will further isolate North Korea from the international community and worsen the suffering of its people. The ministry also noted that the North is making undisguised efforts to to advance its nuclear capabilities at a time when the livelihoods of its people have been ravaged. And the big question, again, it's highly, once again, highly, highly unlikely that North Korea will indeed use nuclear weapons uh, against South Korea, knowing that, it, it, like, like the South Korean government said, it is going to be the end of the regime if they do decide to uh, use nuclear weapons. It's also going to mean the death of many, many civilians out there as well. But the bigger question is, for some quite time now, I mean, we've been talking about North Korea potentially testing their seventh nuclear test. That hasn't come by uh, for quite a bit. And I think there's still talks within uh, North Korea's uh, key government officials the repercussions, right, of what would happen if they do indeed go forth with their test, because there has been some sort of activity uh, in their uh, nuclear f uh, nuclear testing facilities and so forth. And knowing that uh, once uh, another UNSC resolution does go by, that uh, China and Russia are going to be forced not to use their veto power uh, if they do test it. So that's the bigger question. Are they going to really do it or not? I mean, they're running out of options right now to because the I think the other side is North Korea's the, the reason why North Korea might be wanting to uh, test a nuclear uh, test is basically going, well, we have we're fully capable of being a nuclear state. And now we're ready to use that as a leverage to hold discussions with either the United States or South Korea. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, the way that things are going right now with U.S. and South Korea, that they might just completely end any sort of chances of holding talks with North Korea. So I think they're kind of talking about all that. But again, uh, they're going to continue to threaten South Korea with the nuclear weapon use. But that's certainly not going to uh, happen. Uh, speaking of which, the U.N. Security Council uh, set to convene on Friday to review developments related to North Korea in the wake of leader Kim Jong-un and his recent visit to Russia to hold talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, Tana, what will you learn about this uh, meeting? Uh, the meeting convened on Friday, uh, and it was requested by the U.S., France, Japan, the U.K., Malta, and Albania. It was a closed-door consultation, and so not much has been revealed, mm -hmm. but it came as the international community is paying close attention to North Korea-Russia military cooperation in the wake of Kim Jong-un's rare trip to Russia. And so it's mostly likely to have centered on addressing uh, possible developments of the two countries' arms deals and necessary countermeasures. Since their arms cooperation is a sensitive issue, not only to South Korea and the U.S., but to the Western alliance as well, the U.N. Security uh, Council members are widely expected to have pressured and persuaded Moscow to stop advancing military cooperation with the North. The South Korean government, meanwhile, is keeping a keen eye on the possibility of Russia's weapons technology transfer to the North, which could lead to advancement of North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities. And this poses a direct threat to South Korean security, and government officials have repeatedly warned that they will not sit idly by. Now, amid these global efforts to prevent Pyongyang and Moscow from crossing the red line, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is set to visit Pyongyang this month. The minister told reporters himself during the UN General Assembly last month that he will make the trip in a follow-up measure to the Kim-Putin summit. Some also forecast that President Putin may reciprocate Kim's visit and visit North Korea, uh, an issue that's likely to be discussed during Lavrov's upcoming visit to the reclusive state. 
Uh, the closed door meeting is also likely to have addressed North Korea's stipulation of nuclear force policy uh, in its constitution. Let's move on here. Something uh, very interesting that happened over in the United States. And uh, th there were some, I guess, foreshadowing even from the very beginning. If you guys remember at the, uh, the beginning of this year, uh, when they were voting for the U.S. House Speaker, uh, Kevin McCarthy went through after 15 ballots right. uh, before he was voted as the House Speaker. And the big uh, concern with this was that there was a lot of uh, far-right Republicans who did not feel that Kevin McCarthy was suitable uh, as the House Speaker. And House Speaker, of course, uh, if you think about, uh, I guess, the chain of command after the president and vice president, the House uh, Speaker is next in line, so the third most powerful line. Uh, and so after all that, again, foreshadowing, right? Uh, you fast forward some 10 months later, uh, US House of Representatives voted on Tuesday to oust its Speaker Kevin McCarthy. This is the first time in history the chamber has dethroned its leader. Hejung, let's get the latest on this. Right, Kevin McCarthy has become the first leader in the history of the lower chamber of Congress to be removed from the position. Now, this is a huge deal, as SJ mentioned, because the House Speaker is the third mo most powerful man in the United States after the president and the vice president. And this motion to oust Kevin McCarthy was driven by a small group of right-wing Republicans. The motion to vacate the chair of the U.S. House Speaker was introduced by Republicans Republican Representative Matt Gates from Florida. The decision to boot McCarthy came on the heels of his strategic maneuver to avert a government shutdown over the weekend when he relied on Democratic votes to pass a stopgap spending bill after Gates' faction refused to back the House GOP measure. Uh, specifically, the measure extended government funding for about 45 days to avert a government shutdown and allocated $16 billion for disaster relief, which passed the House in a 330 35 to 91 vote hours after Speaker Kevin McCarthy rolled, rolled out the proposal. One Democrat and 90 Republicans voted against the measure. And notably, the bill lacked funding for Ukraine, which, may, which many far-right Republicans oppose and did not include border security provisions that many House Republicans had said were a priority. Now, conservatives said that McCarthy, who made a series of pledges to win the speakership after a marathon 15 rounds of voting in January, as mentioned, broke his word to conservatives by striking the short-term deal. And in a dramatic 216 to 210 roll call vote on Tuesday afternoon, the House endorsed this motion to fire McCarthy from the speakership. Eight Republicans voted against their party leader and sided with 208 Democrats sealing his removal. Meanwhile, McCarthy told House Republicans he will not run for speaker again, clearing the way for a new leader. And since it is the first time in U.S. history that a Speaker of the House has been voted out of office, temporary Speaker will take over, this being Representative Patrick McHenry of North Carolina under House rules. Yeah, again, it gets very interesting with this because, again, you have, even though, you know, the Republicans are considered conservatives, there's the, the far-right conservatives. And for, from the very start, they didn't think Kevin McCarthy was kind of on their similar page in their agenda. And so for them, what the Republicans were hoping for is that Kevin McCarthy makes it very difficult for the Biden administration and the, the Democrats to pass anything. But uh, over there's been a number of uh, shutdown, government shutdowns that could have happened that were averted last minute. And in all those cases, I believe the, the, the far-right Republicans were sort of blaming uh, Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy for sort of helping the Biden administration a bit to avoid the gov uh, government shutdown. And so now, you know, they're going, I'm more sick and tired of this. We got really close to this. And now you're just kind of working with the Democrats here. And so, again, not really surprising. Uh, guys, let's move on over to Thailand here. Uh, very shocking news, especially considering the age of the suspect. You have a teenage gunman 
uh, suspected of killing at least two in a shooting spree at a luxury shopping mall uh, in Bangkok. Uh, Don, let's get the latest on that. The police said the 14-year-old suspect, who was reported to have mental health issues, was apprehended just under an hour after the shooting started uh, and has been taken to a nearby hospital after being interrogated by police. He will be charged with premeditated murder, attempted murder, and illegal firearms possession, among other offenses. The teenaged suspect had been receiving psychiatric treatment but had skipped his prescribed medicine on the day of the incident, according to the police. National Police Chief Torsak Sukvimol confirmed that two people had been killed in the incident. One of them was a female Chinese citizen and the other a Myanmar national. According to the Bangkok Post, hundreds of people, including children, were seen screaming and racing into the streets after gunshots rang out at the Siam Paragon Mall, a major shopping and entertainment venue popular with tourists as well in Bangkok's crowded commercial heart. Emergency service said six others were wounded, five of them critically, uh, correcting an earlier statement that three people had died. Three Thai citizens, one Chinese national and one Laos national uh, were injured in the shooting with varying degrees of severity, according to local authorities. While the case is still under investigation, Police assured the public that appropriate measures are being taken, uh, ensuring the safety of Thai people and foreigners at the same level. Gun ownership in Thailand is high compared with other countries in the region. The the uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, country tallies the second highest gun homicides after the Philippines in Southeast Asia, according to uh, the latest survey. Yeah, I had a chance to uh, see a, uh, a video clip uh, earlier today of a uh, Korean YouTuber uh, who happened to be at the mall, and I believe she was eating, and I believe uh, she was streaming it live, and then you could hear pop, pop. Uh -huh. And uh, I, 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 Thailand does have a history of uh, mass gun shootings. Uh, they do have a very uh, strict uh, gun law, but uh, there are kind of loopholes. Uh, the, the biggest uh, controversy over their gun laws is that it's, it's strict for some and very loose for others. So it's not very, uh, I guess it's not balanced out is what they're trying to say here. And so uh, for a lot of people, again, for a country that doesn't have like all these mass gun shootings like the United States does, I think a lot of people are kind of confused as to what was going on. And once they start seeing people run, uh, run out, uh, it's, you also saw the, the South Korean. So there are definitely South Korean nationals uh, at that very mall. And again, just like uh, Tan said, it is uh, heavily populated by tourists. And so I'm sure uh, many South Koreans are th were there as well. Uh, we'll get more on this as we get more information on that shooting in Bangkok. Uh, let's sort of... Uh wrap things up on a brighter note i guess uh if you're a big fan of uh, movies and film festivals it's a big time uh, especially here in south korea because asia's biggest film festival the busan international film festival or biff uh kicks off uh or kicked off about 35 minutes ago today for a 10-day run at the southern port city of busan uh Hejong, wrap us up uh, tell us about uh, this year's biff Sure. This year's Busan International Film Festival is set to open with a wide selection of art house favorites and commercial blockbusters, as well as star guests to attract movie buffs and cinephiles. The 28th edition of the festival will feature 209 films from 69 countries, including 80 world premieres and seven international debuts. Now, these films will be screened at four theaters in the city with the film titled because I Hate Korea by South Korean direct director Tang Gon Jae opening the festival. Actress Park Eun Bin will be will host the opening ceremony, which just started at 6 p.m. today at the Busan Cinema Center. While Khan winning actress Hong Kang Woo will be greeting guests as the host of this year's BIF amid continued vacancies in leadership roles within the organization. 
And to give our listeners a picture of what to expect throughout the festival, there will be three gala presentations where screenings are held with red carpet events during which fans have the chance to see the directors and actors in person. It will also present films by Korean Americans in Hollywood to reflect the rising interest in Korean diaspora related subjects. Following Lee Isak Chung's acclaimed film Binari and Apple TV Plus's hit drama series Pachinko, there will be special screenings of late Korean actress Yoon Jung Hee's most celebrated films Mist and Poetry, and late Japanese film composer Ryuichi Sakamoto's song Opus in the memory of the influential figures in the film industry. And this year, the festival introduces a broad lineup of works by Indonesian directors such as Moli Surya, as Indonesia has recently rose as a cinematic powerhouse in Southeast Asia. And 10 pictures, including films from South Korea, Japan, China, and Bangladesh, will compete for the awards in the new current competition section as well. And the festival will close uh, next Friday with Chinese director Ning Hao's black comedy, The Movie Emperor, starring Hong Kong A lister Andy Lau. That's right. Just like what uh, Benny said, there's a huge lineup of like these uh, A list celebrities that are coming. And uh, he says he's excited about the Chai Yun Fat. Chai Yun Fat is coming to Busan, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to be there. Obviously, Song Gang Ho there. A uh, number of other. Uh, Asian American uh, actors are also going to be taking part in this and they're going to have uh, different sessions like a meet and greet kind of a session uh, for all the fans out there and uh, one of the things that I really like about this is the fact that now again it's it's interesting how the, the Indonesian films are getting a lot of spotlight because I think the Southeast Asia market is the one that's been overlooked and I think I mentioned this although it's not a film uh, there's a, a Thai drama series uh, that's on Netflix that I got really into. Uh, G- Girl from Nowhere is, is, is what it's called. And uh, they, they make fantastic stuff. And so uh, if anyone's here in Korea and you got a chance to uh, check out the Busan International Film Festival, do so. And uh, a lot of uh, different events uh, taking place there as well. Guys, uh, thank you very much for coming in. I know it's been uh, raining today. Uh, get back home safely. We'll see you guys again next week. Thank, thank you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.